As a visitor to Hong Kong, or maybe even a recent resident, you can't fail to have noticed that we don't have a major international discotheque, which is mentioned in the same breath as Stringfellows in London, the old Studio 54 in New York, or maybe even Zouk in Singapore. But it wasn't always like that, as we'll see in this episode. As it's to the disco we go, as we take a look at the past, the present growing... <coughs> the growing present, and the future of clubbing in Hong Kong. Quite a few discos was really storming down, like Disco Disco, and Horu East, and the, uh, Mingo in Chinchua Cherry, and um, yeah, it's, it's uh, quite a few, it's the uh, golden age for disco, disco uh, scene in Hong Kong. Previously, nightclubs had been sort of some kind of category which one sort of, you know, swept under the carpet and it was all very dodgy. But uh, this was good. I mean, it was like, hey, yeah, this can be good. So you'd get, you know, guys in kilts, you'd get uh, air hostesses, you'd get people who were barely of age, to, you know, and, the, and, then, and then you'd get, uh, you know, stockbrokers or, you know, gay crowd of various shapes and sizes and you'd get some kind of this alchemy come out. The sound system, lighting, dancing, fashion, still really fresh for the, for the young people in Hong Kong and uh, it's just exciting for everyone. Definitely, Lang Kwai Fong had more people going to it, you know, especially girls back in back then, you know, wouldn't sort of venture down to Wan Chai on, on their own, right? Even European girls, and definitely not Chinese girls, you know, because of mom and dad would say, oh, Wan Chai is red light area, don't you go near Wan Chai, right? So, so it was harder to try and get the people down to Wan Chai from Lang Kwai Fong, which were concentrated. For Hong Kong Island, most people went to Lang Kwai Fong. In those days, Lang Kwai Fong, I suppose, was, you know, even more boutique-y than it is kind of now. And there was a perception that there was a market for a large place. And we always felt that a big place would do well in Kowloon, which is why when we opened Canton, um, you know, we found out we were right. And Kowloon was the place for discos from the mid-80s up to the early 90s. Canton Road and its surrounding area was where most of the discos could be found. Apollo 18 in Haiphong Road, now a cinema, the original Hot Gossip, now a bank, restaurant and fashion outlet, and which was replaced in 1997 by another venue with the same name across the road. And Canton Disco, now a restaurant. Uh, I mean, the grand opening, we had something like 10,000 people show up. Um, so we sent out 5,000 invitations, but normally you expect that, you know, half of them will bin, the, bin it, you know. But they actually all came with a friend, and some gate crashes too. Um, <clears throat> so the grand opening that we had Divine um, doing a thing, which was all sort of, you know, groundbreaking stuff for Hong Kong. It was kind of, of the high-tech mold of disco. It was an annoying space because it was L-shaped. We tried to make it a bit more landscaped by knocking a bit of the floor out and having a bit of a higher ceiling atmosphere. But we had the biggest club, I suppose, in Hong Kong uh, in terms of the fact that we did have, uh, we didn't have a restaurant upstairs. It was a lounge connected to the disco downstairs with a, with a bridge and it was, it was pretty spectacular. Another popular 80s hangout was in the basement of a hotel in Chim Sa Choi East, Hollywood East. You'd have certain areas in the club which were kind of, we used to get a lot of people from the rag trade in there hairdressers, et cetera, et cetera. Because it was a very trendy place to go because you get all the movie stars would go there, all the canto pop stars would go there, et cetera, et cetera. So you had kind of different areas. You know, there were certain areas for certain people, as I should say. You'd go there at 9.30 at night and there'd be 100 people queuing to get inside. You know, it'd be so packed. You know, it'd take you 15 minutes to get to the DJ booth. I think one of the reasons is um, most of the, the club owner and uh, the scene before and uh, a lot of the old club, the, the, the regular club, just getting tired and getting bored in the that year's club scene because it's nothing new comes out. You could see the knockout effect right away. You begin to see people who normally go to Hollywood East, you know, like coming to, to work. So you think, okay, I, I don't know, there's a lot of people, but then you would find out that came from Hollywood East or like any other big disc because you would see the knock-on effect because people are clubbers. These, these, these are real clubbers, right? So they're going to Hollywood East, they're going to gossip. So the club and so I mean, like when one place closes down, you know, it's like losing their arm. It's like, well, where am I going to go? <laughs> Rents, again, were like doubling and tripling in the early 90s. So a place which could be rented for 200,000 a month in the 80s was going to be 800,000 a month uh, in, the, in the 90s. And so 
you're, you're de left with a declining possible client base, an old club which, you know, would need $20 million reinvested, uh, and an extraordinarily high rent, which would mean you'd probably need to have $80,000 cash revenue seven nights a week just to pay the rent. <laughs> Not possible. No can. <laughs> I know the Kowloon side, there's always been the smaller bars that have tried to keep something going. There was a, there was a bad period there, the end of the 80s, definitely. I think there was a bit of a, a recovery period over that, over that time. And Kowloon became very influenced um, personally. I think it became influenced by what was happening in Lang Kwai Fong. It became small places only or places on favorable rental deals, more boutique style. And then, of course, later on in the 90s, more dance party situations. Yeah, there's, of course there's a scene, you know, there's um, a lot of private parties. Um, I'm not going to say rave party, dance parties, dance whatever you want to call it, yeah. The word rave, I think, it's, it's had its day, shouldn't use that. But a lot of dance parties, still some good DJs coming over, although I don't really always say that that's the most important thing because there's a lot of good DJs locally who are certainly uh, very good. You, you can't really compare it to, like, anywhere else like London or, or New York or something. It, it's a totally different ball game out here. There is a club scene, but I would say it's a very small one relative to the size of the population here. The club scene here, it's very small, but it's still a scene. And the reason it's a scene, I think, is largely because a lot of, there's a few DJs here who have taken it into their own hands, along with the few promoters that are here, to create the market. I think everything has got a little bit stayed at the moment. Um, everyone's doing sort of the same thing, and no one's sort of going out there in the front and saying, take me leave, and saying, OK, let's do something really, really different. I think we're definitely at the end of something and at the beginning of something else. Because, I mean, particularly with the dance party scene, I mean, We've done a huge number of dance parties since uh, probably 95, at least. Um, now we're reaching the uh, millennium year uh, in a few months. And we've had the handover, which culminated in Unity, which was like probably the biggest dance party in Asia ever. But, uh, you know, thousands of people there. Uh, but since then, we've had like a lot of the crowd that supported the dance scene left town, changed, not been fully replaced or whatever. So there's a lot of changing going on in the scene right now. I couldn't see any, any serious club scene around compared to the other country. I've been trying around, but Hong Kong is a uh, quite a special place. And uh, a lot of the cool people around, but it's very strange, no real serious club in Hong Kong. Not really, not a established club, as in a club to go to. Um, we have, you know, a lot of people use different venues and create um, club nights within these venues, um, but I really feel that, you know, Hong Kong is crying, crying, crying for a club. The club scene in Hong Kong at the moment is limited to parties that are travelling round that can um, make the organisers quite a significant amount of money, but um, they're infrequent and they move around. The culture has moved to events. That's why I keep saying if you're opening a club, you better have three good events a week otherwise you know this whole sort of a club as a local hangout thing is a bit uh, past it these days so it's an event based situation so whether the events take place all in your place or whether they take place in various venues around town people like to think that they can come to an event that's been invested in it's a special thing there'll be something weird going on and the whole of the rest of the crowd will be there there's a club in hong kong and i think it's the f uh we are more adapting to the uh, concept of like uh, what they do in Europe, the club nights, which I think, which is the right thing, it's the right concept. Instead of going out nine times a month and having a good time once, uh, just on a random access basis, you can only go out, you know, you out twice a month, spend the same amount of money and guarantee that you're in the place to be in Hong Kong at that moment. And I can see now in Hong Kong, people are beginning to really acquire a taste for the music and they can even differentiate what kind of dance music they like. I'm talking about, you know, local people. 
you know, they can say to themselves, no, I don't like techno, I like house. No, I don't like house, I like drum and bass. So that's definitely a good thing. But the party scene is really happening in this three, three four years. It's like massive, massive, massive. We do have so many club nights and promoters and, and DJs coming out from overseas to play on a regular basis. So that has to be considered a scene. The club scene over here are very much divided into two main groups. One we call it a very cheesy pop dance in a scene where, in fact, that is a bigger market for Hong Kong. Um, you will have one club, I mean one side of the club scene where it's very cutting edge, very innovative, very um, um, westernized. It shows promise if more venues and managers of these venues are prepared to take a bit of a risk trying out a bit of new music. I believe there is because it says so in BC magazine and they <laughs> wouldn't print it if it wasn't true. Before the break, we heard a little about Hong Kong's past when it comes to the discotheque area and a little about what's happening now. But it does seem that now and for the foreseeable future, most people will be spending their time at a club night, uh, a dance party, uh, a rave. Uh, what do you call it? Rave, to me, is just something that happened before clubs moved into club nights, dance parties, moved into club venues. That's something that happened in England. Um, raves were the illegal parties going around the M25. It's just a name that's been coined by the press and forced back into the public, and the public are then like, forcing it back on us. So, oh, rave parties, it's not a rave. If it was a rave, we'd be doing it in the middle of the field with no licensing and, a, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know, I call them club nights dance parties, whatever. But we never used to call them rave parties, but they se it seems to have become a, uh, an acceptable word in Chinese, like karaoke or rave party. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so we've kind of started using it again because it's become a kind of acceptable expression in Hong Kong slang. <laughs> As a rave party, I don't, I don't like the name anymore at all for years, but it's, for Hong Kong now, it's kind of the, the club, club scene, club scene. Uh, it's mean the club scene almost in Hong Kong, but even in, in, in Europe, I, the people not call rave, just call dance event, just party, that's all. It's a term which doesn't require any further explanation. If you say dance party, people say yes, but then an hour later you realize they didn't understand what you said and they have to ask you. Uh, or they don't ask you, then you think that they understood, but then they actually didn't. We shouldn't just set, set the name on it. Because party is party, what you what you rave party. It's mean not it's the party just bigger. Don't call them raves, to stop it, to stop it, to stop it. <laughs> Three years ago dance parties were predominantly Western orientated affairs. Now you'll go and you'll find <coughs> they're much more local <coughs> to the 50, 60 percent in, in some cases even higher. So the appeal has broadened out. Chinese here I mean, after all these underground parties and stuff, I mean, they are just being more educated about the dance culture. They, they, they know more about the dance culture. They know more about this, the, the party scene, so they're getting more into it. At least 50%, if not 60, 70% local, which was bound, I mean, I knew it was, it was always bound to happen. That, that's the whole point. I mean, we're in Hong Kong. You know, we're doing this for Hong Kong. I'm so glad that I, I went to those parties lately and see all these trendy Chinese people, young, like in their early 20s, or even like younger than, I mean, like a, a 18 years old or something right. like that. I mean, having a good time. We tend to market our, our, our dance parties more to the hip hop and R&B, um, which is a total different market from the rave scene. Um, the clientele, clientele tend to be a little older, a little more affluent. 50% of the people are there for the right reason, have it actually really getting into the music, listening to it. 50% of the people are there 
just because they think they should go because it's something fashionable. But I think that's very Hong Kong. It used to be 95% is the foreigner, West, West, Western people. Now the, the percentage, I think is 70 percent is Chinese in the in the dance party now. It's a good thing for me actually, and uh, it's the market we want to create, and we get it. Hong Kong in particular has come a long, long way in the acceptance of sort of the dance culture without immediately going, oh, it means drugs, because it doesn't mean that. I don't, I don't think really that much as you thought. The drugs everywhere around the world, but um, in the party, and um, at least myself, I don't take drugs ever. And uh, quite a lot of people, they don't take drugs, and I, I know they just come down for dancing. They like, they like the party fight, it's cool. If, you, if somebody said the drug scene is mean the rave party, it's not fair to the people like me. You know, I've been, I've been doing this for too long for somebody to come in and try to represent the music that I feel for and, and relate it to something that I, I have no interest in. From a promotion perspective, we know we work with the authorities. We have excellent registered security personnel working for us. Um, we do everything that we can to try and take the emphasis away from the drug and the rave element and look to more, as more of it being the club element, the you know, quality entertainment. Thank God, Hong Kong has already been through that, which every, every city goes through. They go, dance music comes up, there's an association with drugs, police come and crack down, everybody goes ballistic, oh, drugs, 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 and then everything calms down. And now, you know, two years ago, Hong Kong went through that big crackdown where, you know, you'd have 100 policemen coming into a, a rave, so-called rave, a party with dogs and searching everybody and all the lights are up. You know, the, that, Hong Kong's been and gone through that. So now we can, like, move on, move on, move on, move on. I won't bring over a DJ just because it's a big name or, you know, they're doing fabulously well in a certain part of England or America or wherever. I feel it has to be appropriate to Hong Kong. Of course, a local guy always has an advantage that he knows the crowd better than the guy who's importing. People say, well, why, why are you bringing all these overseas DJs that nobody's ever heard of? But they don't understand that there's going to be a few people who will say, wow, you've got this DJ. Man, I really want to do what this guy's doing. And then you have, like, X amount of local kids saying, you know, going out and buying turntables and saying, yeah, how do they do this? How does this work? I, re I really want to get into this. But they're all of a very high standard that shouldn't be ignored and, and shouldn't be just saying, oh, they're local DJs because that's, you know, you know, all these big stars in England are only local DJs. It's just their pulling power. A lot of the international DJ come over and uh, we local DJs spinning together and we do well. And uh, it makes the local uh, uh, the disco club customer realized the DJ doing and uh, it's easier for we guys to push the new sound. That's how we create a scene and that's how you create the whole culture and get it moving forward. If you go to like a uh, local club night which which is not rave party but it calls rave, rave party here you see you see those local Chinese DJs getting more and more popular people know their names people People scream at them. I mean, yeah, they are rock and roll star now. Hong Kong is, is quite unique. I mean, as you know yourself, you've moved around uh, uh, various parts of the world DJing. Wherever you go, uh, the music styles tend to be different. Hong Kong is still um, locked into its own music scene. Uh, things have started to progress a little bit now with all the, the raves and, and specialist parties that are going on. Hong Kong's a hard place to DJ. Hong Kong is like a real mixed crowd of people and no one really knows what they're into. Well, it's a total commitment, amazingly, because you've got to be one at one with the music and at one with the crowd. And it's almost like, I mean, when I was doing it, there was no concept of like doing sets, right. you know, like we have now. It's the music he plays and the way he puts it over. I, I would say that's probably the, uh, 
what makes a good DJ, although you can't put it a pen to paper. It's just the vibe. But it's like riding a bike, you know, a little bit shaky at first, but once you get going, you're okay, I think. It does look easy, and it looks easy if you're good, and that's the thing. The DJ got to um, know what they're feeling and build up the atmosphere slowly to the peak and go down again, up again. <clears throat> that's why it's very important. The people just if, just tell me, hey, I got a good record, and just play it, and he's a good DJ. Approach it. It requires the same kind of gifts and the same kind of intuition as being a musician to do it right. I mean, anybody can blunder around and put a record on, it's true. But uh, when you're in the hands of a virtuoso DJ, it's almost impossible to not recognize that fact. I couldn't dream of working in that now. It would be too much. It's just people, you know, and you'd have the guys come up there who wanted to share poetry with you that they were going to give to the girl over there in the blue dress. You'd have the girl in the blue dress up here looking for other guys. You know, it was just, it was the podium, the DJ booth. Amazing. It depends on the DJ. I mean, the music in and of itself <clears throat> is really, the songs are like parts of a story. So if you've got someone who's putting it together and it's like, excellent, you know, you, you really know you ha this is special. If, you, if you're operating a venue like this and you've got DJs up front, then they're as important as anything else in the club. They have to be able to look at the room, read what's going on, and they have to be able to rotate the clientele through the room. He's probably one of, one of the key people here. Um, certainly in any, any sort of club environment, I think, the DJ. Simply because a DJ, a good DJ, is able to read the crowd and to read the moment and understand what they should be doing. For DJ, always talking about the music, music scene and, and want to create something and get the message. We are the guy, we are the bridge. And um, show the, the people something they don't know, they never touched before. What you need is a, a guy that's got a background um, in various sorts of music that can adapt, that can be an MC, um, that can uh, create a dipness, different atmosphere with his, uh, with his music. And so if you don't have a good DJ, forget it, you're not going to do any. You won't do well in this business, that's for sure. They create the atmosphere, um, but don't tell them that, tell them that, tell them that. The DJs of Hong Kong say, yes, you shall go to the dance, if you know where it's happening. That's our quick look at some of the people involved and some of the places to put your best foot forward in Hong Kong. Next week, we're going live. See you then.